صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله عليكم السلام ورحمة الله It's good to be here amongst the brothers and sisters after some time in this monthly halaqa uh, and um, see brother Zishan has just walked in as well Assalamu alaikum It's good to see mashallah the, the halaqa going on I think, is it been five years or three years or five years? Five years, five years no. So we had your five year anniversary mashallah We still remember when we had the first halaqa uh, with myself and Sheikh Thaqi and Sheikh Akram Ladwi and mashallah the brothers, you know, Brother Salman, Ibrahim, Yaqub and uh, Jawad and Jamal, you know, all of you brothers have kept it going, alhamdulillah, it's a really good thing, it's a really good blessing, inshallah, it's uh, developing some community here, inshallah, in Hounslow, uh, which is what we need in these times that we live in. Uh, so forgive me for not attending so often, but I've obviously been diverting my energies towards teaching a history course that some of you have also attended, inshallah, and those who haven't, please attend in future. Uh, but it, yeah, it's really good, alhamdulillah, to be here today. Um, if uh, Khadija and Mariam can hear me, please come upstairs, there's space at the back for sisters. Are you already there? Yeah. Okay, well, good, good. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, they've been putting me under a lot of pressure that, you know, you've got, you've got, you have to better do a good talk and everything. So, you can be, you can be here to hear it firsthand. And, um, they've been asking, what's it about? Nature of reality, what's it about? So just wait and see, inshallah, keep in suspense. So, alhamdulillah, good to see you all here. I'm feeling uh, fresh and ready for this talk. No, no pressure at all. And um, I, have a, I have a patient at work. You know, whenever I see him, this particular patient, he always says to me, oh, Dr. Salim, I know you're under a lot of pressure. You're very stressed, you know. <laughs> Every time I see him, he says that to me. And it makes me feel so like, oh, stressed. <laughs> stressed and under pressure. I say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm fine, you know. The so doctor said, him, I know I can see you're under a lot of pressure. I don't want to put you under more stress. So alhamdulillah, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm, I'm fresh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. Uh, the talk today, the title, Nature of Reality. When I told Brother Faisal, you know, the title, Nature of Reality, he said, ah, oh, mashallah, that's deep, you know. <laughs> no, of course it's deep, we can't really get more deeper than that. So, alhamdulillah, I've got a few notes to make, my, make myself, keep myself on track, inshallah. And um, how long are the talks nowadays in Halakha? Hmm. <laughs> how long should we say? We finish by about 9.20. Yeah, um... As, as you know, I mean, one of my teachers, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, when we used to study with him, he used to say, what's these, you know, we just keep having these lectures that are one hour, 40 minutes, and nothing's changing, everything's staying the same, you know, we need to go in more in depth, and have like, give, give teachers more time. <laughs> so he used to do talks about three hours, if Jamal knows, because he was there, so my face will know, we used to just let him talk, you know, two, three hours, four hours. And I'm just scaring you now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what year? Oh, man, you guys are getting stressed now. What year was that? This was back in 97, 98. When, he used to when we, we started studying with Yusuf. Yusuf of Zaytun. Yes. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I can see the pressure, the stress now. <laughs> and the brothers. No, I'm just joking. Um, inshallah, it's a, it's a light gathering, so we'll try to keep it just, um, you know, to the time limits. And I can skip some points if we if I get too uh, carried away. So the nature of reality. Uh, philosophers have <coughs> talked about this, debated this question for probably thousands of years now. Uh, Brother Dawood, I saw Brother Dawood somewhere. Come, come forward, inshallah, so we can, I can see you. You're not know, see you in the back there, and you're quite hidden away. So, so these 
uh, these things have been deba debated for thousands of years. Now, the Greeks, uh, about 2,500 years ago, the Greeks developed uh, what we call philosophy now. Uh, we don't know if people before that were talking about these same things because we only have certain knowledge about history back to the ancients. Before that, for hundreds of thousands of years, human beings were here. We don't really know what they were doing or what they were saying because we don't have any documented evidence. Back till about eight or nine, 10,000 years ago, we have actually written. So as far as, and, and for our purpose, I mean, the Greek philosophers were crucial because they had a major impact on both Muslim thought and Western thought. So the Greek philosophers that came around about 500 BC, uh, people like um, uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and so on, they were, they were talking and debating about these type of issues. And this, uh, you know, they, they were using their reason or their aql, uh, intellect, uh, to discuss, debate, investigate. Uh, what is the nature of reality, and so on. Uh, so Greek philosophy and science then later on came into the Muslim world uh, in, with Islam. Uh, the Muslims uh, were quite interested uh, in the Greek uh, philosophy. The Muslims actually, they, they, they translated many different works of Greeks, but also Indian, Sanskrit, uh, Chinese, basically the Muslims were interested in knowledge wherever it could be found, as it was obviously integral part of our deen. And the, the Muslims particularly were attracted to the Greek philosophy and science, uh, rational thought and philosophy and so on. And so Muslim theologians, they engaged uh, with the philosophers as well. Uh, so you had the Muslim rational uh, <coughs> theologians also uh, debating with the philosophers and so on. Later on, many centuries later on, during what's called the Enlightenment around the 18th century, uh, this uh, Greek philosophy also came into Western culture uh, and came into Western thought. So both civilizations received uh, philosophy, uh, but the outcomes were different. With uh, the Muslims, they took on the philosophy, uh, but they retained their faith. So Muslim philosophers, and we had many throughout the centuries, uh, they all retained a belief in God and a belief in the Quran. Although they may have had certain interpretations that the mainstream theologians didn't quite agree with, the Muslim philosophers, they, they kept that belief. When the philosophy came to the West uh, in the Enlightenment, the early Enlightenment philosophers, they also believed in a, a supreme being, a creator, but as the thought developed in the West, uh, the Bible became undermined. When, especially the German uh, scholars of the Bible and others were started scrutinizing the Bible from a scientific point of view. The Bible was not able to withstand that scrutiny and it was found to be basically a, uh, it could no longer be considered to be a divine revelation. Yeah, it was just a historical fact that the Bible was something that was written a couple of centuries after Prophet Isa a. Salam, by certain authors, most are unknown, apart from the names that are given. And, you know, there were so many things in the Bible that could not withstand uh, scientific progress. And I think, personally, I think this is the key difference why the Muslims retained, the Muslim philosophers retained their faith, whereas the Christian civilization lost it. Because the Muslims had the Quran and the West, they had the Bible. The Quran, despite every uh, advance, scientific, philosophic, the Quran was able to remain untouched 
and undisturbed until today, alhamdulillah, wa shukrulillah. Despite the extreme uh, progress of science and knowledge within Western civilization, uh, not one thing can be taken to contradict the Quran, which is really uh, phenomenal uh, when you deeply reflect on that. So the later Muslim philosophers actually developed philosophy in a direction uh, which they called, they started to call, in the early time it was called falsafa, literally falsafa, which is from the Greek uh, philosophy. Later on, the later Muslims, they call it al-hikmah al-ilahiyah. And it just shows how the Muslim philosophers, you know, it's the, the divine wisdom, that's how philosophy was uh, taken forward in the latter period, especially in places like India, Iran, and Turkey. In the Arab world, it was lost actually, um, to a large extent, because of the theologians who made a very strong critique of uh, philosophy, uh, people like Imam al-Ghazali, Fakhruddin al-Razi, and so on. Uh, it wasn't studied so much later on in the Arab world, uh, but in the rest of the Muslim world, Turkey, Iran, and India, it was still uh, developed to a great extent. Um, so in the West now, where has philosophy taken Western civilization? The two major schools of philosophy, or they're not really schools actually, they're sort of like uh, the two major branches of philosophy in the West today are what's known as positivism and relativism. And they're not very different from each other anyway. Uh, the positivists are more associated with the Anglo-Saxon or English-speaking uh, philosophers of so Britain and American philosophers tend to be positivists, whereas the continental French and German philosophers tend to be within the general branch of relativism. Within these two major branches, you have many different schools of philosophy, but these are the sort of overarching paradigms that they're working under. So what do we mean by relativism and positivism? Positivists, uh, in both of these <coughs> branches, they've given up any metaphysics. So they no longer believe in a divine creator or a, a source, you know, a creator source in their philosophy. That was given up a century ago, you know. And they came in their intellectual um, progress, or well, not really progress from our point of view, uh, they came to the point where they said, look, we, we can't really uh, rationally talk about God. So the relativists are those who say that there's no reality or no truth that can be proven. Yeah, these are the relativists. There's no reality or truth that can be proven. This is where 300 years of their intellectual growth or the advance in their philosophy has taken them after 300 years. There is nothing that we can know. In other words, we know nothing. <laughs> I'm not joking, I mean, this is, this is true, right? Obviously, they won't put it that way. But that is actually true, yeah? <coughs> and and um, actually, this is nothing new, because this type of relativism was there uh, during the time of the Muslim, the height of Muslim uh, intellectual progress. The Muslim philosophers uh, addressed these questions of relativism. And it was even there at the time of the ancient Greeks. So when people like Socrates and Plato and these guys, they were arguing that there must be a, a creator, there must be some sort of source to everything intellectually. They had these people coming up to them and debating with them and saying, no, how, how can... And, and at that time, they were called sophists. They were called sophists. 
Um, there were just people who would put doubt into everything. You know, to say, how can you know this? How can you know this? How can you prove this? How can you prove that? They keep taking you back and back and back. Uh, so they were dealt with by those uh, philosophers, you know. And, and in fact, if you look at our books of theology, our advanced books of theology, like some of you brothers studied the um, uh, uh, Taftazani uh, with us, uh, the, the very first point where the theologians start is addressing this point, you know? Those that come and say, how can you know anything is real? How can you know anything is real? How do you know I'm real? How do you know you're real? How do you know the moon isn't made of cheese? Right? This is the first point they say. The first point is we believe that things are real. Yeah? We have to believe that things are real. If you remember, Sheikh Mustafa Steyer was here some about a year or two back, and he gave a whole talk actually on this exact point. Uh, he's someone who knows much more, you know, he's gone in depth into uh, philosophy and things, and this particular point he's really researched in depth, you know, that, that things are real, yeah? Now, so what they, what they said, you know, our, our, this is where theology starts. Because if you, if you can't have this basis, you can't really go anywhere with anyone. Yeah, if, if someone's going to just say, well, I don't believe anything's real, I don't know if anything's real, you can't move forward. You can't prove to them that there's a God, you can't prove to them anything, rationally, or in any other way. So they're stuck, and that, that's the first point of the theologians. In other words, this is absolute, absolute fundamental that things are real, yeah? And we're going to come to that uh, in a while, inshallah. Now, so the only thing you can say to these type of people, and even, you know, Plato relates this from Socrates as well, and this is also in our books of theology. To these sort of people, you just have to say to them, look, put your hand in the fire. You put your hand in the fire or jump into the fire if you don't believe anything's real yeah? and they will never do it that person will never do that because ultimately they're living their lives based on the fact that things are real even they who claim to be relativists they live their lives based on the fact that things are real yeah so it's all well and good talking the talk but when it comes to uh, doing the thing, yeah? So that's basically, you can't, in other words, you can't really debate with this type of people. Even Socrates, as Plato related, he said something similar to them. He said, well, wait till you die then, and you'll see what reality is. Because these are people who were just, uh, they're sort of, you know, just uh, sort of stubborn or just, um, that's where the word sophist come from, sophistry. They try to be very sophisticated with all of these clever arguments, ultimately to prove nothing, and to prove that nothing is true, or we can know nothing. Yeah, and if you look at the books of Western, you know, in Western philosophy today, all of these relativists, uh, you know, all of these philosophers, French philosophers, and all these people, most of their work is unreadable, even to very in intelligent and uh, uh, educated people. Because it's just so, so it's just sophistry, you know, very complicated, uh, and and the nature of uh, truth is not like that. Truth is always straightforward. Uh, but that's what they do, and sometimes you know I've met, I see sometimes I see these uh, young Western Western men, you know, in their twen early twenties, and men, you know, young young men and women that are often questioning things about life and origins of life and purpose of life. And you know, these, these, are, these are thoughtful, intelligent people. And then to find the answers, they start reading these books of philosophy. And they can spend years and years and years <coughs> just trying to understand what these guys are talking about. You, know, you can spend your whole life reading that stuff and just try to figure out what they're saying. And at the end of it, you're gonna understand that you know nothing. 
Yeah. But, of course, it's a bit more dangerous than that. Because not only do they say that they know nothing, or they can be sure of nothing, they also say, you know nothing as well, and you can be sure of nothing. This is a dangerous bit here. Yeah. Yeah. They're, not, they're not just saying it for, to themselves, but they will then put it upon you as well. Yeah. In other words, they will start putting doubts in all of your knowledge and anything that you believe. And this is where we find actually a contradiction. A very simple contradiction, but a very profound one in their own teaching because think about it if they say you cannot we can know nothing we cannot be sure that anything is true or real how can they be how can they say that you know nothing how can they make that statement and believe that it is true yeah. in other words they contradict themselves and people have pointed this out. I, don't, I didn't just figure this out myself. Others have pointed this out, you know. Relativism in itself contradicts itself as soon as it tries to put its teaching onto someone else. Yeah? Does that make sense? Or are people falling asleep now? Sorry, just... Yeah, yeah sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't mind, no. The whole basis, I mean, there, what, what you just said, I mean, it brings up, so, I mean, I just want to resist to, to, to butt in a little. Because yeah, the whole notion of them being curious mm. is, is, is in itself a testament that they have ingrained in them a curiosity of who they are. So a person, a human being, he, he's curious by nature to know he feels that he is something that, that, that is beyond his comprehension, even himself, let alone God. Like God says in our Quran, it says that we, we've given you signs in yourselves and in the horizons. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole point, I find that in fact the ingrained curiosity that we have is a testament of the divine, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because where does this come from? What, what is the quest for? Why are we questing? Because we feel inherently that there is something that has brought this order about. Even the Quran again says that if you, if you are, if you, if you doubt, then why don't you pray for death? It says in the Quran, why don't you ask for death? Do they ask for death? Mm -hmm. And this is about, this is the, to the Meccans. It was I, don't, I don't think you said if you doubt, then why don't you ask No, no, it wasn't about doubt, but why don't yeah. they pray for death? Okay, they you're saying that, not the Quran. No, the, in the Quran yeah. it says. Well, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I think it says in the Quran, mm -hmm. there is a particular ayah, I can't remember it in Arabic. The, the, but it, it says it. about the Yahud, if you believe that Jannah is for you and you're the chosen people, then pray for death if you're truthful. That's right. That's a bit different. That, about, that's about that's what I mean. So why don't you pray for death? And then they, 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 they because they were, there is, was a contradiction. But if they're they, doubting, they won't want to pray for death. Yeah. Because they doubt the Akhir as well. Yeah. So I don't think they would pray for death. This they is probably it. pray for a longer life. But this is, this is the whole <laughs> yeah. point. The point <laughs> is that they... You're they, talking about the other people who believe in the Akhir. Yeah. But they what, should pray for what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at mm -hmm. is that there is an inherent contradiction, A, with non-believers. Yes. And the other thing what I'm trying to say is that what I'm convinced of is that the whole, like Rumi says, that the answer is in the question. Because in their whole notion of uh, denial and whatever is because they, they feel that they need to comprehend in an empirical way. And they are limited. We are limited. Yes. The knowledge and everything is limited. Yes. It's a very, very um, enlightening thing for you to talk about. So, yeah, as the, as the uh, brother was saying, um, the, the key thing with the relativism is the contradiction is within itself. If you can be sure of nothing, 
then don't say that nothing is true or that anyone else what they say is not true because you can't be sure of that yeah now the positivists they believe not not really much different but what they said was you know what we can what we can really believe in is uh, science and mathematics yeah we can believe in science and mathematics because it's based on hard facts so in a way they they accept that things are real yeah so they're slightly different things are real we can measure we can we can believe we can't believe in any other sort of uh, religious stuff or any superstitious stuff as they call it uh, but what we can really rely on is mathematics and science and <coughs> and maybe logic as well yeah uh, so this was the idea of positivism and you know people like Bertrand Russell uh, one of the most famous uh, philosophers in the 20th century of positivism he he wanted to really you know put down a really solid basis uh, for for what he called logical positivism he wanted to build a system of logic based on mathematics because mathematics was seen as something really you know can really rely on mathematics with the mathematics you can't go wrong right so he wanted to he wanted to put down a really solid basis that you can build upon so he started with the most simplest and most fundamental thing you can imagine which is 1 plus 1 equals 2 Yeah, one plus one equals two. He said, "If I if I can just completely solidly prove this basic thing, from that we can slowly build up and build up, and eventually, and he actually said this, in the end we'll find out all the answers that philosophers have ever thought about. But we have to have that really core, fundamental, strong, solid. No one should be able to question that. One plus one equals two, right?" And he wrote a famous, uh, you know, treat part of a book, about two hundred pages. He wrote about two hundred pages to prove that one plus one equals two. Mashallah. <laughs> But unfortunately, he got it wrong. And later mathematicians have shown. that it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hold it doesn't hold because what they showed was that that even to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2 you have to have some assumptions in there that you cannot prove externally there are always some assumptions there's always something you have to rely on in the first place before you build something on top of it so this is where they are this is basically where western civilization has taken us yeah they spent hundreds of years trying to prove 1 plus 1 is 2 and then they messed up <laughs> and now they they basically saying they know nothing okay i agree <laughs> so from there what's it on okay i'll just skip a, skip a couple of little bits here um I think we'll yeah we'll skip on to the next bit. Um, so here now we come to what is what what do what can we say uh, with regard to all of this? First of all, we can look at the Quran. Now, in Arabic, the word what's the what what what's the word al haq al haq? What does that mean? Truth. Truth. Yeah. What else does it mean? Anything else? Fact. 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 Yeah. Fact. Reality. 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 Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So in Arabic, the 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 word for truth is also the same word for reality. Mm-hmm. It's not. Uh, it doesn't. It's it's actually the same word. You know, sometimes you can have one word with more than one meaning. Yeah. It's not. Uh, Um I don't know what I'm trying to say anymore but al-haq means the truth but it also means reality. You know this is really quite profound. Now Arabic is a true language. It's not a made up language like English. 
Yeah, oh, some of our scholars, as if it's a true language, it's a revealed language. It's a language from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Arabic, the words in Arabic are, are real. They have a reality. One of my sheikhs, he said, uh, in Arabic, if you say, nar, 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 fire, fire, fire. If you keep repeating it and repeating it hundreds of times, your body temperature will heat up. If you say in English, nothing will happen. Fire, fire, fire. Anyway. <laughs> Probably the fire brigade will turn up. <laughs> but if you say in Arabic, nar, 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 you, you body turn, we can do this as an experiment. Maybe the next halakha. <laughs> Everyone bring a <laughs> thermometer. Yeah? <laughs> bring a thermometer and I'll do about a thousand times. I don't think we should record that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. We could do it as a scientific experiment. I don't know if it's. I believe it's true. I believe it's true. Because the, the Arabic words they have a, a reality. Yeah? They have a reality in. in uh, and. So it's interesting that that word al-haq. <laughs> no. Now I must say, think about the word al-haq as well. You know, the, the, the actual word itself is probably the strongest word you can imagine. Al-haq. Ha is a very strong letter. Some people do tajweet here, right? Uh, some of the sisters do tajweet. <coughs> And then the qaf is one of the strongest letters you can make in your in the human uh, thing. In in fact, most languages don't even have it. Yeah. But in Arabic, Arabic has got certain letters that no other languages have, like bad as well. The the qaf is very strong. And this is not just the qaf; it's a double shadda, isn't it? So al haq is very powerful. Uh, and it means truth and reality. So when you read the Quran, it gives you a whole different dimension when you see the word Al-Haq, bear that in mind. You know, so one of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Haq. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Exalted be Allah, the king, the, the, the truth or the reality. Or the true reality. Now, the ultimate reality, the ultimate reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So when we, inshallah ta'ala, when we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah, may Allah make us of those who will see him, of the true believers, when we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when we will be in true reality. That is when we will face true reality for the first time. Or maybe we had before, but we have no knowledge of that time before. Right? So, in a way, the human being, it's not surprising that they have a slight doubt of their reality. Because the human being is not truly real. هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيئا شيئا مذكورا Has not a time come upon a human being when he was something not remembered In other words, it didn't exist The human being did not exist So something that did not exist, it cannot be truly real Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-haq The true, the real who was there always and always will be there. So in a way, it's deeply ingrained within us to have this doubt about our reality. And that's why we have to have faith in this world. When we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there'll be no doubt about our reality or anyone's reality. Because we will be in reality. But that is the only real. That's why when Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he said, Rabbi arini anzuri lake. Oh my Lord, show me so that I may look upon you. But Musa alayhi salam was not given that in this world. No human being has been given that vision except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The only human being was given that vision 
in this life on the Mi'raj. Imagine how strong his reality was, his certainty after that vision. Prophet Ibrahim السلام, in the Quran, he says, Rabbi Arini Kaifa Tukhi al Oh Allah, show me how you bring the dead back to life. Because we believe that the dead will become back to life when we have become dry bones and dust. We believe that Allah will bring us back to life, but it's very hard to imagine. So he said to Allah, Arini Kaifa Tukhi al show me how you're going to bring the back, dead back to life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Awala tu'min, do you not believe, O Ibrahim alayhi Now these prophets are the people with the greatest belief, of course. <coughs> Prophet Ibrahim alayhi said, Bala wa lakini yatma'inna qalbi. O Allah, I do believe, but so that my heart may find this tranquility. So as they say, seeing, seeing something is different to believing. Yes, what's that term, what that famous saying? Seeing is believing. Right? <laughs> Although now we know that the eyes can play tricks on you. People can hallucinate. But still we have got a very as human beings we have a very strong faith in something that we can see. Right? And for example, how many people have ever been to China? Anyone been to China? There's one uh, shy person there with a little hand. How many people here believe that China exists? How many people here believe that China is real? <laughs> or oh, let's put it that way. Who, who cannot be one, who is not 100% certain that China exists? You've been to Japan, isn't it? But you haven't been to China, so. Are you 100% certain? 100% certain. Uncle, are you? 100% certain? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good, a truthful person. A relativist in our midst. <laughs> I have, I have, I have a, yeah, I mean, there is a, a tendency in my human faculty. <laughs> that, 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 don't, don't go too much into it. But <laughs> inshallah, you get the point. I mean, there's a, there's a point of knowledge and certainty, right? It's what the Quran calls al haqqul yaqeen. We only get to the stage of al haqqul yaqeen when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, we have various degrees of faith and certainty. Like Sayyidina Ali, anhu, he had so much certainty. He said, if you were to show me the hellfire and the heaven in front of me, it would not change me in any way. It would not change my certainty in any way. So there's different levels, you know, of certainty. But that true certainty, the absolute reality, will come when we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, may Allah make us one of them. Amen. So, as we say now... If we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, what can we do to get certainty? Don't forget there is another, there's another avenue, there's another means to not seeing Allah but knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what we have, the speech of Allah, the Quran is a speech of Allah. This is something phenomenal. You know, so imagine you meet someone. You know, just think about what is speech. What is speech? When you meet someone for the first time. So you've never seen this person before. He might look a bit Chinese, so you might guess he's from China. But let's say he just looks average in every way. You can't tell anything about this person. Yeah? You've met this person for the first time. You both stand there looking at each other. And no one speaks. For a long time, no one speaks. What do you know? What, what do you know about this person? What can you know? Well, let's, let's say you can't even see this person. Let's say you're in the dark or you've got your eyes closed. Yeah? You, know, you know nothing, next to nothing about this person. What's his background? Where's he come from? What's he thinking about? 
he's got a blank expression, you know, like I normally have. You can't, you can't, you can't tell what he's thinking about. What's he thinking? What's he doing? You know, who is he? Where's he come from? Where's he going? Is he going to kill me? Is he going to give me a gift? I don't know. I don't know anything about this person. He's a mystery to me. Complete mystery. You know, he could be a Nazi for all I know. Yeah, it could be, it could be, it could be ISIS. He could be doing the suicide bombing. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not in any way condoning suicide bombing or anything like that. So now, when the person speaks, when the person speaks, then you suddenly start learning a lot about that person. Yeah, you learn a lot. Because that person's speech it comes into your mind and you understand it. So what is inside that person now you understand, you, you get to know what's inside that person. Yeah. That person may tell you all sorts of things. And it's only through the speech, because we have this language, then we understand that we start understanding a lot about that person. Yeah, and with the longer time you spend with someone, you know, we get to know each other, don't we? So that's what the Quran is for us, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the Quran is. It's his speech. So when we read that, we get to know him. And we get to know him in such a way, such an intimate way, you know, many of us have not really comprehended that, that aspect, the power of the Quran. That's what it's there for. You know, to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's going to bring certainty in a way that when we see him, we will get cert absolute certainty. When we hear his speech and absorb it and understand it, it's also from him. So it's bringing in us certainty. So we go to the Quran if we want certainty. And I'll finish with just a few ayahs just straight from the Quran on this uh, theme. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qala falhaqqu walhaqqa aqool. He said, and this is when Allah is addressing Iblis after he's refused to bow. Qala falhaq walhaqqu aqool. He said the truth and the truth I speak. Yeah, don't forget truth is also reality. So, so it's amazing, you know. La amla anna jahannama minka wa mimman tabi'aka minhum ajma'een. I will fill up the hellfire with you and with all those who follow you. Talking to Iblis. All together. And it's amazing the Quran actually says that about these relativists or sophists who question everything, is anything real? The Quran actually says when they are thrown into the hellfire, Allah will actually say to the people in the hellfire, Alaysa hadha bil haqq. Is this not real? Is this not real? It's quite profound, you know. Uh, that these people, this is where Western thought has brought us. With truth, with reality, we have sent this down. And with truth, with reality, it has descended. We have not sent you except as a giver of good tidings and a warner. A Quran that we have, sorry, that we have divided so that you may recite it upon the people with some delays. What we have revealed it in portions. Say to them, believe in it or don't believe in it. 
إن الذين أوتوا العلم من قبله إذا يتلى عليهم يخبرون للأذقان سجدا Those who were given knowledge before this Quran in other words, the ones who received the revelation before they when it is recited to them they fall down in prostration because when the when you hear the Quran that's what it causes a complete recognition that this is al haq and you fall down in prostration that's all you can do wama khalaqna samaa wal arda wama bainahuma batilan we did not create the heaven and the earth and all between it in falsehood because batil is the opposite of al haq this was not created in falsehood dhalika dhannu alladhina kafaru that is the mere conjecture of those who disbelieve for waylun lilladhina kafaru min an-nar warned or woe be to those who disbelieve from the hell fire wa nada ashabul jannati ashab an-nar an qad wajadna ma wa'adana rabbuna haqqa the people of jannah will say to the people of the hell fire this is something that will happen obviously the people of jannah and hell fire not going to be chatting to each other all the time but on this occasion allah will uh, cause them allow them and the people of jannah will call out to the people of the hell fire we have found what our lord promised us to be true to be reality fa hal wajadtum ma wa'ada rabbukum haqqa have you found what your lord promised to be true you know was what your lord uh, warned you about qalu na'am they say yes now they admit this is real this is haq but it's too late then fa adhanu muadhinu baynahum an la'natu llahi 'ala al-zalimin and they muadhin will call out between them that the curse of allah be upon the oppressors and the wrongdoers ma khalaqna as-samawati wal arda wa ma baynahuma illa bil haq we did not create the heavens and the earth and all between them except by truth or reality wa ajalin musamma and an appointed term wal ladina kafaru amma unziru mu'ridun those who disbelieve just turn away from the warnings that they are given wa khalaqa as-samawati wal arda bil haqq he created the heavens and the earth in truth ta'ala amma yushrikun may he be exalted upon all that is associated with him sadaqallahu alazim shukrakum ala khair for listening to me may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq fill our hearts with iman and yaqeen may allah give us the opening to understanding the quran reading the quran understanding the arabic so that we can get to know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May Allah make our yaqeen and our iman as strong as it can possibly be. May Allah guide us in these times of trials and tribulations, in these times of fitna, in these times of doubts. May Allah make us strong in our faith. May he make our community a community that is strong in our faith. May he bless our families, our parents, our children. May Allah help our children to grow up in these times. with strong iman and yaqeen and amal upon the deen may allah give us tawfiq to become people who take his message and convey the truth to the people around us may allah make us those who bring the truth against falsehood may allah make us amongst those who sacrifice their wealth and their time and their lives for the sake of the truth and for the truth to be uppermost May Allah make us have mercy on us have mercy on the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam have mercy on the muslims in the east and the west may he have mercy on those who are suffering and in troubles and tribulations may Allah grant us to meet up together on the day of judgment under the banner of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to be in jannah wa sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam 
سبحان ربك رب العزة عما سفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين اليوم سلام الله خير